So one of my favorite places in this region, it's actually where I did my weekly video this week, though we had some technical difficulties getting it up online, is the Potomac River down at Old Angler's End. And if you go down uh, along the river there and park and kind of go onto the towpath, there's a little area uh, immediately after you enter where you can actually go right down to the river itself. It's a place where kayakers and paddleboarders like to put in uh, when they're um, kind of uh, uh, paddling around on the river there. And I like it because it's incredibly calm and peaceful. And it's a quiet place often where you can do some good thinking and reflecting. But the truth is, and the signage all around you tells you this, that the river there is actually quite tumultuous. The undertow, no matter what the calmness of the top of the water may communicate or appear to communicate, the undertow is so severe there that it's quite treacherous and dangerous. It's not a place to mess around unless you know what you're doing. And when I'm down there, I'm often put in mind of two uh, great kayakers, um, uh, uh, major sort of uh, um, developers of that discipline and that sport, Tom McEwen and Whit Walker, who are both from Bethesda originally, and as students at Landon, uh, a private school in Potomac, as high schoolers in the 1970s, traversed for the first time the Great Falls. And even to this day, if you go to the overlook a little bit up the towpath, you'll see kayakers that are either coming down the falls or, or sort of paddling around in the, the white water underneath the falls. And it's an incredibly astonishing sight to behold. Um, it's mesmerizing almost to know that they can so be attuned to the river, so pay attention to the complexities of the situation that they know how to traverse the water, how to come through it safely and come out the other side. And I was put in mind of that reality this week as I read our gospel lesson. This is the final week of a three-week arc that we've had where we read through the majority of Luke chapter 12. Now, there are bits and pieces that have been cut out of our lectionary lessons, but we've more or less heard the arc of this particular chapter. It's a phenomenal chapter, densely packed with a lot of teaching on Jesus's part. And I want to spend some time today kind of reviewing what we've heard in chapter 12 and making sense of this rather complex and difficult teaching that we have from Jesus at the very end of this chapter, the teaching that we have today before us. Chapter 12 falls sort of at the beginning of a major section in Luke's gospel that traverses or follows Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, beginning in chapter 9 and ending uh, more or less at chapter 19 as he enters Jerusalem and prepares for his final hours. And in this section, we have this extended discourse over the entire chapter on discipleship, a discourse, a teaching on discipleship that kind of manifests itself in a variety of ways. But over the course of this chapter, even though we have these sort of discrete elements to it with a couple of parables and a couple of dialogues and interactions, we have an overarching concern on Jesus's part and in his teaching with hypocrisy and the way in which hypocrisy causes problems, but also how we as faithful Christians, as faithful followers of Christ, are to overcome or respond to that hypocrisy. The very beginning of the chapter that we heard two weeks ago is this warning against hypocrisy. As the crowds have gathered, Jesus addresses the Pharisees, addresses those who are following the Pharisees. And he says, if we recall back in 
the end of verse 1, beware of the yeast of Pharisees, that is, their hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing is secret that will not become known. And then he goes on in the subsequent verses to exhort faithfulness and belief and trust, even in the midst of great fear, even in the midst of challenges. He exhorts his followers not to worry in the face of uncertainty. He exhorts that when we are faithful and true to his teachings, faithful and true to what God is doing in us, the Holy Spirit will manifest itself within us, will give us, as he says later in that chapter, the words upon our hearts so that we don't even have to worry about what it is that we are to say that the Spirit guides us in all things as long as we remain open to what the Spirit will have us to do. And then we get to this section in verse 49, which is what we hear today. And it's quite alarming. It's alarming for a couple of different reasons. One, it's alarming for the tension that it communicates, let alone anything else that Jesus says over the course of his ministry in the Gospels. This, this is quite disconcerting, what we hear Jesus saying to us today. But it's also disconcerting because it, it seems to contradict other teachings that Jesus has other teachings that Jesus communicates about how we are to be in relationship with one another and what it means to be a follower of him. Because at many times throughout the gospel lessons, Jesus teaches us that to be a follower of him, to be in tune with what God is doing in this world, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to have a deep peace a deep trust, a deep faith in what God is on about. And yet, what do we hear today but Jesus saying that there is no peace in his reign, that he does not bring peace, but that he brings turmoil. And so what are we to do with this? How are we to understand it? And what, what is it that we fundamentally hear in Jesus' teaching today. Well, I've spent this last week kind of trying to unpack and reflect on all of this, and the reality is that there are a lot of scholars, a lot of theologians who just kind of let this be and move on. They get uh, sort of into the weeds and the details of the different sources from which this Lucan passage might have been drawn. They look at what is uniquely Lucan as opposed to in other Gospels. They want to bring in the discussion of the Q text uh, or the Q source, which might have been a, uh, uh, an oral source um, that was foundational to both Luke and to Matthew. But the reality is that there's not a whole lot that folks have to say about this particular passage in a pastoral sense. And so we're left to kind of wrestle with it and discern its intricate and complex details and to question for ourselves, what, what is it that Jesus is saying to us today? Well, I want to offer a couple of suggestions based on what we hear, but also based on what we've heard in our epistle readings over these last couple of weeks as well. First, I think we can't hear this end part of chapter 12 without taking into account what we hear at the beginning of the chapter, this full discourse on discipleship. Because yes, there's a lot of sorrow and pain and suffering and difficulties that are suggested in this latter section, that it is Jesus bringing about the reality of the kingdom that will cause these tensions and divisions in the world. But we hear that truth communicated with the, with the prior admonition and the preceding verses that tell us not to worry to trust, to have faith, 
to be open to the Spirit. And the truth in that is that even in the midst of the turmoil, when we pay attention to the whole of the chapter, and really the whole of Jesus' ministry and teaching, what we're told is that these trials and tribulations are a part of our lived experience. The forces of the world, the powers and principalities, always and forever are opposed to the work of God. And so, yes, when God's work is manifested, when Christ comes among us and manifests himself in this world, that causes this inherent tension. There are difficulties, there are trials, there are tribulations because of that incongruity. But in the midst of those trials and tribulations, we are to have the reassurance that God's will will win out, that God's love and compassion and truth are ultimately the things that matter, ultimately the things that we are to pay attention to, ultimately the things that we are to have trust in. And therefore, when we confront these difficulties, we are not to worry, we are not to fret, but we are to instead glory, glory in the trust and truth of God's ultimate victory. But what Jesus is pointing out here, too, is that when we do that, when we have this deep sense of trust, it will disrupt and fundamentally destroy even those things that seem deepest and most rooted in our material world, those relationships of familial kindredship, those relationships that matter most deeply to us, the things that we want to cling on to most desperately, even those at time may come into conflict with the ultimate truth of the gospel. And what are we to do, but even in those instances of deep struggle, to still trust, to still trust that God will see us through. Because what seems to matter most in this world, even for our context, but family, family so often is that which we cling to most desperately. And while that's true for us in our day and time, that was even more fundamentally the case in Jesus' time in first century Palestine. And yet, and yet he's saying here, even that will sometimes come in conflict with the truth of the gospel. And into that conflict we trust. We trust and we have faith and we do not worry. But it's one thing to say that. What does it mean to more fundamentally live that out? And that's a question that I think is left relatively unanswered in the somewhat ambiguous teaching that we hear from Jesus in this chapter. But as we have this wonderful and, I think, brilliant pairing in our lectionary lesson with St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, we have a little bit of an answer here in chapter 11. And in chapter 11 today, we hear the uh, uh, sort of ending piece of what Jesus has, or what Paul has been teaching over the course of this chapter. But if we go back and we recall what we heard last week in the middle section of chapter 11, we're taught that as people of faith, we are foreigners upon this earth, that we look from afar upon the kingdom of God, that we see the city, and we know that that is our ultimate aim and goal and purpose in that life, in this life, and that our citizenship ultimately rests in that place, in that kingdom of God, and that what we journey through here in this life is but temporal and is but temporary. And we hear that communication more fully as Paul continues to develop that part and that point in chapter 11 today. 
He says, By faith, people passed through the Red Sea as if on but dry land. And when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been enriched and circled for seven days. And by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And he goes on to list these other saints and forebears of the faith as well. And the great ways in which they, like the ones mentioned today, also journeyed and transversed this world as but temporary pilgrims, looking ahead over the horizon towards that great city of God. And Paul ends this section today, the beginning of chapter 12, saying, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that's, that is the way in which we are to respond to what it is that Jesus is telling us in chapter 12. When we encounter these difficulties, these divisions, when we see the great disruption that can occur in the midst of these trials and tribulations of the world, even disruptions that seem to, to impact us at our deepest level of being, we are not to worry. We are not to get stuck or mired in those disruptions, but we are instead to continue journeying on, witnessing to the great faith to which we commend ourselves, the great faith that we proclaim, the great trust and truth that we have in the ultimate goodness and the ultimate prevailing of God's goodness in this world. On one final note, as I said, we can kind of look at St. Paul's admonitions in Hebrews to understand what that means more fully. But I want to give an example particular, particularly of what this looks like in our lived experience. As many of you know, as I mentioned last week, I've just returned from another journey to the Holy Land. And I had the great fortune to be able to go a few days before our pilgrimage started and to reconnect with many of my close friends who were there in the land. And as I mentioned in one of my earlier uh, writings on Facebook, I know many of you have followed those, I went uh, three Sundays ago now, uh, maybe four Sundays ago now, with my friend Canon Wadia Far as we uh, went and conducted the service for uh, a mutual friend of ours who was actually here in Northern Virginia at the time. And his church, this uh, uh, friend of ours, his name is Father Jamil, his church is in Nablus, modern-day Nablus, which is biblical Shechem, where Jacob's well is located. And we went to conduct the Eucharistic service for Father Jamil in his absence. But early, early that Sunday morning, around 3 a.m., a raid had been carried out by Jewish security forces that had uh, resulted in the death of three individuals in that community. And there was a lot of contention about what had happened. The Israeli government said one thing, the people of the community said another, and regardless of politics, the truth was that the situation, the environment, the the context into which we were going in Nablus that day was one of great tenseness, one of great uncertainty. The community was very much on edge. So much so, in fact, that that morning, Wadia had said to me, you know, I don't know that we're actually going to go today because uh, they may decide in, in safety to not gather together for worship. The, the Leadership of Nablus had actually encouraged folks to stay inside, to not be out because of potential uh, retaliatory violence. But 
as the day went on and as Wadia phoned back and forth with the members of this congregation, they said, no, 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 we want together. We don't want to let this prevent us from being together, from worshiping the Lord this day. And so we got in the car and we drove to Nablus and, you know, you could tell, you could tell the tension. It was palpable. It was palpable. It was palpable in the community. It was palpable in the congregation itself. But we worshiped. And in that worship, you could feel that tension ease, that trust, that faith, that God would see them through. It was incredible. It was, it was such a life-giving and light-transforming moment for me. And then further, after the service was over, Wadia and I spent some time in conversation with a young man who's a member of that parish and a postulant for holy orders in the diocese. He may soon be coming, actually, to Virginia Seminary to study. And as we visited in Novelis, Novelis, a city that is often bustling with activity, the silence around us was consuming because of the hesitancy of folks to get out. And yet, about ten minutes into our conversation, we all of a sudden hear this cacophony of sound. We discover that a small family had carried forth their wedding that had been planned for that Sunday. And in the midst of so much uncertainty, in the midst of admonitions to stay home, to stay safe, they decided to, just like the congregation, that they were not going to let hatred win, that they were going to proclaim love, proclaim love in a wedding feast on that day, that day of so much pain, that day of so much sorrow. And there, too, I was struck. I was struck by the audacity to hope and the audacity to continue in faithfulness, even in the midst of so much suffering. And what we hear, what we hear in today's gospel lesson is precisely that kind of admonition. And I think we often kind of have difficulty in our context, understanding the fundamental truth of this lesson. Because the reality for us, friends, is that our life here is quite easy. Now, over the last decade, maybe longer, we could point to times of uncertainty in our context. We could point to the pandemic, we could point to the political unrest, and we could say, oh, we know sorrow, we know pain, we know suffering. But truthfully, we can gather here with ease. We can gather here without fear. We can gather here without difficulty. We have great freedoms and abilities here to worship. Great freedoms and abilities that are not shared by many of our brothers and sisters the world over. And so when we think and reflect on this discourse on discipleship and we think about what it means to have great faith in the midst of difficulty, I think we should be ever more mindful that our difficulties are but a modicum of the difficulties that our brothers and sisters face. And that great faithfulness for us might be even more of a challenge because of the complacency and comfort that we experience in our context. And we should be ever more mindful of the lengths, the lengths that so many of our siblings around the world go through to do what we have the privilege to do here today. And so, as we listen to this admonition anew, as we hear the call to discipleship, even in the midst of division. My prayer for us today is that we will more fully know and understand the truth of the kingdom of God, the truth of our location as 
members and citizens of that kingdom. The truth that the travails and trials of this world are temporary and that the material comforts that we so often rest in are things that will fade away, things that ultimately don't matter, and that we might be renewed in our spirit, renewed in our convictions, renewed in our commitments to live fully for the kingdom and not for the things of this world. That is my prayer for us today, and that is my prayer for us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.